Hello, it's Scott Manley here with a completely new series I'm working on. So I decided to, uh, well, I'm not giving up on reusable space program. I am, however, stepping sideways to look at the Killer Asteroids space program. So, uh, yeah, Killer Asteroids, one of these things I've had a lot of uh, work with in the past. So uh, I'm starting out by um, performing a mission to place a new type of space telescope into an orbit which will make it far better at detecting asteroids which could hit the planet Kerbin. And the idea is we will put it into an orbit that is inside roughly around the same orbit as EVE and this will be able to scan the vicinity of the planet uh, near uh, exterior to it. Now, uh, this also gives me an opportunity to show off Barkland's Curb X, Space X um, implementation. It's a model that basically copies the Falcon 1 and the Falcon 9. And it provides a nice payload shroud, some fuel tanks, a uh, first stage, a second stage, all the stuff we need for a good old time with uh, the Kerbal uh, X. It is kind of wobbly, unfortunately, but uh, other than that, it flies relatively well. Uh, I found that you probably don't want to have the um, automatic stability control system enabled for the second stage because it causes it to drift. But other than that, it's looking pretty good. You can see we're picking up some uh, quite some spectacular speed here. In fact, we get we're probably going to go fast enough because uh, this rocket is built for a much higher payload. Oh yeah, look, we're getting a re-entry effect. We are going so fast that we are triggering the re-entry, but we're about to run out of fuel and perhaps we will slow down before uh, that causes too much of a problem. Good thing we have that payload failing there. Of course we can do a proper decouple, disconnect, you know, rather than the explosive kind that we Kerbal pilots are more used to. So yeah, we're going to bring this thing up into orbit. It is it's designed for a much higher payload than what I've got here. I just need needed the payload shrouding to be as big as it was because I'm trying to copy a very specific space mission. And uh, that space mission is the Sentinel project that is being developed by the B612 Foundation. Now this is not a a mission that is being designed by a government. It's a mission that's been put together by a private um, your charity organization essentially. The, the B612 um, foundation is essentially set itself up as a tax-free you know, charity organization taking donations to help save the world from the prospect of you know being hit by a killer chunk of rock from space and it is a very noble goal and I fully support everything they do and uh, there are a lot of really good people involved with this they're looking for something like $450 million from donors and the idea is they will be able to launch a telescope. Uh, something like the Spitzer Space Telescope um, that will basically be an infrared based telescope because it's actually easier to see a lot of asteroids in the infrared than it is in the optical. If you remember my asteroid discovery vi um, video there is a section towards the end around uh, 2010 where the, the WISE telescope comes online and it's able to detect asteroids in a whole bunch of areas that the regular observations weren't seeing them. So this is following the same notion. The thing about WISE was that it had a camera that was cooled by liquid helium and their supply of liquid helium was only supposed to last like a year and a half. And So now it's basically not operating anymore. Um, the Sentinel system is going to use a cooled camera with a proper active cooling system that will be able to operate you know for as long as it can i mean there are the mission lifetime they've talked about is six and a half years and during that time it will orbit the sun something like 15 times there we're just jettisoning the fairing and you can see my version of the sentinel spacecraft inside there i have got mechanical jeb 2 installed i'm, I'm just flying this manually because I know it's nice to fly things manually. It is a launch. I mean, if you can't launch, then, you know, you're definitely in trouble. Now, uh, the payload, you look that it is a bit asymmetrical. I've got these two um, structural panels, basically, on the side with solar panels on them. Those are essentially a heat shield, right? Those are going to protect the payload interior to that. 
uh, from direct heating from the sun. They're also going to act as solar panels, and the real one actually has several layers of these because keeping the camera cool is incredibly important to making it efficient. Now the camera which is being developed by Bell Aerospace is an interesting kind of hybrid. It's essentially a very wide field detector with uh, lots and lots of small detectors. So the idea being that it's cheaper to build small detectors but then have lots of them. It's just a linear scaling. Whereas if you want to have a detector that's four to with uh, you know twice the linear dimension, that's four times the area and typically 40 times the cost or something ridiculous. But by doing lots of smaller detectors, lots of smaller CCDs, of course, it becomes much more commodity hardware and cheaper. Now, this thing, of course, will orbit interior to the Earth's orbit, and it will need, like, deep space tracking network to talk to it. But the spacecraft itself is largely autonomous with enough processing power and onboard storage, something like 96 gigab gigabytes. So uh, there it will be able to, you know, scan the sky on its own, classify objects, find things that are moving, determine their orbits, and when it talks back to the deep space network, it will be able to pass its findings on. And the idea is that uh, it should be able to detect anything that is bigger than about 140 meters, and it will detect lots of objects much smaller than this. I think the goal is to get 90% of the objects that are 140 meters or bigger. And that's like a you know, pretty sizable uh, pretty sizable object. It's not quite continent busting, but if it was to hit, you know, a populated area or even, you know, within 100 miles of a populated area, it would be you know, serious bad news. So detecting these things and finding them is very important. You know, back when we were looking at the killer asteroid, as we say, issue, uh, the cosmic impact threat, you know, we kind of we thought that the small ones were the ones that were would happen on political timescales, but it was the big ones which were easier to detect. But now, with technology improving, the smaller ones are actually a much more viable alternative because people can think on timescales of 100 years and things like that. They can't think of time on timescales of 100,000 years. That uh, becomes a little hard. So now we've got ourselves in orbit. We're uh, going to get ourselves uh, injected out into our interplanetary trajectory and you see of course we're using a I, I purposely did a whole orbit around the planet because the injection point if you start at time zero is right over this giant impact crater on Kerbin. It is a weighty reminder, a geographical reminder of why we are doing this. Um, now the actual Sentinel mission supposedly will go directly into an interplanetary transfer but I, as I said, I, I'm doing it my way because it looks better, darn it. Yeah, that crater there would have had to have been caused by something, you know, <laughs> very large. If, if you were to have a crater that size on Earth, it would be something that was like 40 miles across easily. Uh, this is obviously a scaled down planet, so the amount of delta V needed is a whole lot smaller. Anyway, yeah, this is the interplanetary injection stage. I believe... The, I'm not sure whether they would use a spin-stabilized interplanetary injection stage. Uh, I, I haven't read that much detail. I'm more interested in the camera myself. But um, there we're going to get up. and you, We're just watching the, in the bottom right corner the apoapsis. It will eventually go negative, indicating that we have passed beyond the sphere of influence. We are going to escape the sphere of influence of planet Kerbin. The, see, what happens is when you're on a hyperbolic trajectory, your periapse remains normal, but your apoapse goes negative, which is a fancy way of saying very, very, very long way beyond infinity. Anyway, there we are. We are on our injection transfer. Now we just got to bring the orbit down a little further. And I, I could have used a maneuver node to do this, but, uh, you know, you'll just see. I'm just going to point it along this. You'll also notice my steering is very wobbly. To try and get this space probe designed, it was a bit off-center with the center of mass, so it does tend to torque around as I'm trying to, as I apply acceleration to it. It it was just a design that was very hard to replicate with any in any manner that let it uh, be stable. Let's say. So there we go. We're gonna set up uh, an, uh, whatever a circularization burn here. And that will be great because we'll be able to use Kerbal Alarm Clock to put our, put our window in, put a, an alarm in to remind us. 
And that's... Uh, oh, we got an old one there. Uh, we're all ready to go. The old one, I don't know, I guess was from a previous attempt. Uh, <laughs> yes, this has been done before. Uh, the previous attempt, however, was done with the Soyuz, and then I found that somebody had done a really good Kerbal X pack. So uh, I decided to stick with it. And let us say farewell to the planet Kerbin. We hope when we leave you, you are a beautiful place and you are safe. And we hope to maintain your safety by telling you of any threats that may be coming your way. I mean, so this is the, this is the whole... Um, you know, asteroid threat issue. B612 originally set out to go and explore the possibility of diverting an asteroid, and that was kind of their main goal. However, they decided at some point that detection was a higher priority and perhaps a more feasible goal, something that people would perhaps donate to. Um, or, you know, money would be more readily available for something more feasible. So the Sentinel telescope is a you know, brilliant idea. Because if you look at things like the Chelyabinsk meteor, and I probably mispronounced that, as far as we can tell, that was not detected beforehand. It literally came out of the sun at the planet and flew overhead. And the first that most people knew about it was when people were on the ground tweeting, oh crap, there was a meteorite flying overhead. Awesome thing about that event was that people tweeted that out and then two minutes later, the shockwave hit the ground, the audible shockwave. And people inside started saying, what the hell was that noise? So if you look at the tweets around that time, you can actually see like a two minute gap between the first sightings of the, of the object and the audible reports. Anyway, um, rather embarrassingly... And uh, this is not indicative of regular flight operations. I have forgotten to turn my spacecraft and maintain its solar panel orientation with respect to the sun. So uh, I'm going to have to come around for another pass on this. Uh, my spacecraft is dead in the water. Obviously, this would not happen in real life because you would have mission control telling the spacecraft to maintain its orientation. However... Uh, I am human, I am fallible, and I am distracted doing other things. It does happen on occasion, of course. Uh, the SOHO probe, the SOHO uh, Solar Heliospheric Observatory, it was a an object, a spacecraft that would watch the sun, and it sat in the Lagrange point between the Earth and the sun. And during one operation sequence when they were working on maintenance or something, they accidentally caused it to turn basically turn away from the sun and that meant its solar panels were no longer illuminated that was bad uh, and so the, the thing ran out of power and they lost all contact with it but as it moved around the sun the rotation of the sun and the earth eventually caused the orientation to come back and illuminate the solar cells again so after three months they were able to reacquire control of it and uh, it's still actually running to this day. It's providing great data. Okay, so now we have power on this thing again. I'm going to rotate it around into an orientation that will let me maintain the power a little longer this time. By aligning the spacecraft with the normal vector of the orbit, we should be able to cover 270 degrees with the, the panels, which are basically at 90 degrees to each other, so we get decent coverage. Hopefully that will uh, stop this thing from happening again, because it's rather embarrassing having to wait a whole extra orbit. There we go. Uh, that's it. And so we'll now just continue around, and you'll see me doing time acceleration. And as we time accelerate, the sun appears to move against the background. But in fact, it is us moving around that sun. Obviously not a real sun. Not the, not the real sun that we would be dealing with. The, everything... Everything in this is obviously scaled down to make way for the, the Kerbin system. The real the real launch would meet much more Delta V and probably real engineers and rocket scientists working on it, not virtual engineers like me. There are some very smart people involved with this, and you know I have a lot of respect for all of them. There's um, uh, Rusty Schwickert is one dude. He was an Apollo astronaut, and there's Ed Liu. He is another astronaut. He was on uh, the... He was on this Expedition 7 to the space station, I believe. He's like the, the chairman and CEO of B612. 
I, I think they uh, they go around giving talks, and they're actually going to be one at Chabot this weekend. That was the place where I was sitting inside the Mercury capsule. Uh, unfortunately, Saturday night, it's a date night, and, you know, I don't think my wife wants to go and see these awesome people talking about killer asteroids, because I talk to her about killer asteroids all the time, and she tells me to shut up sometimes. That's just part of being married to an awesome person. Anyway, look, we've reached our final injection burn. We are ready to circularize this orbit somewhat. So, uh, yeah, let's clear this out. Yes. Give me control once more so that I may circularize. circularize. Uh, <laughs> it was not the best. This thing looks great in silhouette. I'm, I'm kind of keeping it in silhouette so you can't really see the final spacecraft design. But if you go to the B612 site, you'll be able to see their design for Sentinel. I have done a very crude approximation using the parts available to me. Uh, as I said, anything I do should not be taken as an example, as a representative example of the final product. Ah, look, there we go. We can see the solar panels there. Um, the actual, the actual thing would have more layers of insulation there. Now, this thing has more than enough delta V by the looks of things. You can see the the green bar going down, and our fuel is basically we have one third of our fuel supply left. So. We could do a whole lot more. Unfortunately, the telescope itself is not really designed to operate with a giant um, uh, spacecraft attached to it. Now, I believe, but I'm not sure, that the, the actual Sentinel mission is probably going to use a Venus interaction, a Venus flypass, to help circularize the orbit. And that might actually be the constraint on the, how long they remain there. But uh, I am circularizing it simply because otherwise I would have to wait a really long time for an actual encounter and, and actually getting circularization can sometimes waste a lot of effort. It, it, mostly it's because you're trying to hit a tiny keyhole. But look, we've d ditched this and now we are free to go about and do our scientific mission. Now, during operations, the spacecraft will essentially remain with these solar panels facing the sun so that the telescope in there, which I am activating, it's actually a Keithane detector, which won't do very much because there's no Keithane in the sun. Um, we have a little antenna that folds out there using damned robotics. And uh, yeah, it's going to sit with the shield there and it will rotate on this axis slowly so it can access the whole of the sky. Now, I'm rotating it rather more rapidly than it would rotate in the real uh, operation. I mean, typically I think it would rotate once a day on this axis. Maybe not, maybe twice a day. The point is it, it would rotate very, very slowly because it's doing full sky scans and it needs to scan every object, you know, every time it picks up an object it needs at least three data points and preferably more to get better and better orbital and, uh, parameters for it. It would classify these things figure out how far away they are and ultimately it would send that data back home and we would decide whether there was a threat worth dealing with. And hopefully in the event that a threat was in fact identified and found, we would have enough lead time to actually do something about it. If you have a long enough lead time, it's very easy to imagine how to adjust its orbit. And of course you can guess where this is going. Future episodes will in fact deal with uh, dealing with these things. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.